Um, there's still folks in the waiting room. So we've got a lot of attendees today. Very excited about this. Um, I am gonna be pinch hitting for Jane today. She's at the Historic Preservation Council meeting. So um, you don't have your usual host, but we have a great program for you. Um, so welcome to our uh, continuing series talking about preservation. We're, we're trying to uh, stay engaged with our community by holding these uh, series of noontime chats. So I'm gonna keep my usual spiel a little brief today. Um, and just let you know that we have a lot of our staff members on this call today. Um, Preservation Connecticut is the statewide um, nonprofit and we are a statutory partner of the State Historic Preservation Office. So we work closely with um, the state office there. And our executive director is Jane Montanaro, who sadly is not with us today. Um, I am Stacy Vero. I'm a circuit writer and hopefully we'll be joined by Jane and Brad um, when they finish up their meeting in Hartford. So with that, um, and also I'm being helped today by Jordan Sorens and I need to give her some major props for backing me up today. Um, so our mission is to preserve, protect, and promote the buildings, sites, and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. And um, our goal through this is to help educate the public on the topics of uh, preservation today, the most important topics in preservation today. And we really wanna introduce you to the experts in our field, which is why we're super excited to have um, the folks at Beacon and Krosky with us today. And we wanna hear from you. So please contribute to the conversation today and um, you know, send in questions to the chat, raise your hand, we'll be listening. And with that, we can get started. You guys, if you wanna tell me when to advance the slide, um, just let me know, okay? Sure. Right. So I, I guess I can kick things off. Um, so my name is Thatcher Tiffany. I'm with Beacon Communities um, in the development group. I'm, I'm joined by Emily Bhutan from, uh, from Beacon and Michael Weisbrod uh, from, from Krosky along with Bill Krosky. Uh, and Mike, I'm supposed to start right with the with the facts on the first page. Yep. So you can advance to the next slide. And you know, most I think most of the presentation is really focused on the historic aspects and interesting, you know, architecture um, that we were able to preserve here in the history. Um, Oops, sorry, guys. Yep. Yeah, got it. <laughs> but. Uh, but I'll just start with sort of the general, like how, you know, what, what the program ended up being and how we, how we paid for it. Um, we got involved in this development uh, a number of years ago now, I wanna say uh, 2016, I believe. Um, it was complete, uh, you know, a mill effectively abandoned. Um, Michael show some pictures later, but like trees growing out of the roof um you know a lot of water damage and and we were challenged by a number of folks including the town and some state people that 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 made us aware of the project to find a way to um you know revitalize the building and redevelop the building in in a way that was useful um it was a huge issue for the town this sits um kind of at the gateway for windsor locks uh, it's the first thing you see when you drive across from Enfield. Um, it's on some of their more exciting real estate, you know, right on the river, um, right on the canal and, and a canal trail um, that leads up to Suffield. So it was really, the town was very focused on trying to figure out something to do. Uh, where we ended up is um, doing a mixed income development, um, meaning there are both affordable and market rate uh, apartments in the building about half and half. Um, true, a true mix, 160 units, um, uh, it's 222,000 square feet. 
in, in really three buildings. There's, there's three buildings, sort of the phases of, of the mill as it was developed. And I will just run through the financing for those that are interested in those sort of things, like how it got paid for. And I'm, I'm happy to go into more, more detail, but I'll go down the list in the, in the notes here. So, um, you know, we did have a first mortgage um, and a construction loan, you know, just like uh, any development. Um, and that was with the Bank of America. Bank of America and also a Boston private bank, a bank in Boston. We had a ton of support from DECD and the town of Windsor Locks, um, essentially DECD, which was passed through the town of Windsor Locks for complicated reasons, which we can discuss. Um, also support from the Department of Housing. There were um, federal low income, it says LIHTC here, that's low income housing tax credits um, and, and the associated equity. Those are allocated by CHFA, Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. Um, and we had federal, also historic tax credit equity um, and state historic tax credit uh, equity slash loan. Um, that, that the trust, this group, the trust was involved in. Uh, happy to talk more about it if folks are interested. And uh, we had brownfield zone. This was a brownfield site. So in addition to being historic and abandoned, it, like a lot of historic buildings, there was pollution in the ground and in the building that needed to be dealt with as part of any redevelopment. Um, you know, underground storage tanks, lead, uh, asbestos, um, things that needed to be removed properly, which, you know, cost a lot of money to do. So we got some support from the state on that. Uh, the next item here, TIF district loan. So we had a loan from, we, we have a TIF district, uh, which stands for Tax Increment Financing. And this is a, a state program that towns can use to um, set aside future real estate tax revenue um, in order to support uh, redevelopment. And the idea is to, both, to be able to provide a tax break, but also mm -hmm. pull off some of the tax mm -hmm. increases to use for investing in the district. Again, happy to get into more of that in detail, but a neat tool. Um, you know, this wasn't a ton of money here, but, but interesting. Um, Investor reimbursement is listed here. I can, Emily, I can't remember what that is. <laughs> some some quirky like, thing. Yeah, yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah. And then we, we let, you know, Beacon made our own development cash flow investment in the, in the project. And we deferred, um, we deferred fee as well, which is a, a way to, to, to make these things, things work. But that's the basic. We're, we're really, you know, excited to be nearing the finish line. It's been uh, many years in the work. Um, actually, relatively fast for a project of this type, I think. We got lucky in that we were able to as assemble financing really not much more than a year after, you know, our first visit, um, maybe a year and a half, uh, which is, which is a, I think it, it could have taken another year easily. So, you know, um, it's great to be done a few years later and the buildings um, leased up and it looks great. And the canal trails open to the public, which was a huge goal for the project, not just, you know, making it great housing for people that live there, um, you know, with these ex amazing views of the river, but also improving access to the river for the town. So, you know, the, in the image you see um, where there are little people walking, that's the canal trail that runs for four miles. So it's like a, a walking, running, biking trail uh, connects up to Suffield. And then it, there's actually a pedestrian bridge um, that goes over to Enfield from there. So a really neat um, uh, connection. And this was there before, but you were going past an abandoned building. There were like squatters, like bad things were happening. Now, instead of that, you're going past an occupied building. And then we also created a little town park at the northern end of the site. So there's like an actual place 
to, you know, like sit and enjoy the river and the canal, um, you know, maybe, you know, a place to park, a safe place to park. Um, so we're really pleased, pleased with that outcome. And I'll turn it over to Mike to take you through uh, how, how it actually, actually got done. Thatcher. Uh, my name is Mike Weisbrod. I was the project architect uh, in charge of this project. Um, just some quick facts on this slide before I move on to the next one. It's a fairly large mill, 220,000 plus square feet, uh, six stories on the river side, five stories on the canal side. Uh, as, as Thatcher mentioned, uh, this is a, a mixed use in terms of uh, market rate and affordable housing. And uh, architecturally speaking, this was interesting because the mill itself was actually, technically speaking, three different buildings. Um, we can advance to the, the next slide. Um, you now, there were other smaller identifiable portions of this building um, than just the three I'll talk about here, but um, keep it simple, we'll just talk about the three. And there were also some other um, freestanding buildings to the north of the building that are in most cases no longer there and in addition, some to the east, which are also no longer there. Um, and you can see through the aerial photo here, um, to the north of the main mill, you can see some um, foundation remnants amongst the rubble there. Those are actually the buildings from um, they, they date back as early as the 1860s. Uh, those are the earliest buildings on the site that were constructed. Uh, they burned down uh, about 15 years ago or so. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the site was developed from the north to the south. Um, so with regard to the main mill, uh, building one, which is the building that faces um, perpendicular to the river, is the oldest of the main mill that was built in 1891. It's um, fairly typical mill construction. It's heavy timber framed, uh, brick exterior walls. Building two was built in 1904. It's similar in construction type, although um, it is a little bit different in terms of the layout of the structural grid and the timber sizing and all of that. Um, but building three is, I think, probably more iconic of the, the structures here. It's uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, one of the earlier examples of this um, building type built in 1920 just at the end of World War I. Um, as you'll see, we go through photos. It's got some um, interesting interior features. It's got uh, mushroom, flared mushroom columns in the whole nine yards. So uh, quite an interesting building. And um, for those of you interested in terms of what this mill was used for historically, um, they actually used to make yarn here. Um, so they would spool together um, different pieces of smaller thread to make yarn. And later on, um, which is what the J.R. Montgomery Brothers are most famous for actually uh, metallic thread and wire and um, tinsel, which is what they became most notably famous for. And this mill was actually in operation until the 80s, believe it or not. Um, and it's been closed um, since we've been able to open it back up. All right, so now we'll get into the, um, the program of the building. Um, I'll run through this fairly quickly. The basement level, um, includes some covered parking, um, some mechanical space, and some limited community space. Um, and you'll understand why we get farther into this, why the common space is so limited down there. And the first floor um, is mostly apartments, um, off of a double loaded corridor. There's also a uh, leasing suite off to the left of the, the upper plan you see there, uh, along with a pretty spacious lobby and mail room. You can advance to the next slide. And the upper floors are fairly typical in terms of their layout, um, primarily apartments, again, off of a double loaded corridor. Um, but the left side of the building where buildings one and two meet, there are some um, amenity spaces on each floor and it varies per floor. So there's a fitness room, there's a, a business center and a, and a community room located within that space. All right, we can advance to the next slide. So, before I, I get into the next few slides, which are going to be focused on the, the project challenges, I just want to talk a little bit about the site because, as you'll see, most of the challenges that we faced, at least the big ones, were site related. Um, I mean, the building itself posed its challenges um, given that it's over 100 years old, um, but the site itself is, is fairly complex, so I'll, I'll kind of give a brief overview. 
um, so the Connecticut River is to the bottom of the page, uh, which is to the east, and the canal system is on the opposite side of the building um, to the west. And um, there's some, some nice wooded area to the north and, um, of the mill and the, the old um, buildings where they once stood. It runs for miles. It actually runs all the way into the next town of Enfield. And there's no access back to the mainland um, from this peninsula. So the only point of access to the mill and the stretch of land to the north is this single access point um, on Bridge Street. So um, the, you can think of the the site is an island in, in this regard. Um, and then you'll, you'll see why this became a bit complicated. Um, we can, all right, we can advance to the next slide. So the first challenge I'll, I'll talk about here is um, the fact that the site floods. Um, the basement level itself is actually in the 100 and 500 year floodplain. Uh, when we first arrived to the site back in 2016 to begin surveying, um, you could actually see the, the lines of the flood waters in the basement up four or five feet. I think that was from the, mass, the last major flood in the 1980s. Um, but I think the first winter of construction, you can see on the photo in the bottom right, um, you know, we did experience the waters coming up pretty high. Um, they didn't come into the building, but um, you know, it rose several feet on the Connecticut River. So because the building was in the floodplain, uh, we had to deal with flood proofing the building. There are generally two ways of doing this. There's dry flood proofing and wet flood proofing. Uh, from a dry flood proofing standpoint, the goal is to keep the interior dry, hence the name dry flood proofing, which involves um, totally not allowing any water to enter the building. Given that, you know, this building is um, brick, brownstone, 100 years old, that was simply not an option for us. So we needed to go with the wet flood proofing scenario, which is allowing flood waters to come in and then recede out safely without putting any um, lateral pressure or anything like that on the building. So the way that's done, there's a series of calculations you need to go through to determine um, how much open area you need to have to allow the waters to come in and come out. After running through those calculations, we determined we needed a lot of openings. Um, which, which scare us a bit, given that we would have to install all of these openings into the, um, this beautiful building. Um, but our, our structural engineer, Jim Grant, um, my hat goes off to him for this approach. We were able to devise a way to allow the waters to um, primarily enter and recede through the vehicular openings of the garage and building three basement. And by installing a series of these gates, which you see in the upper right hand corner within the building, the flood waters are able to move in and out um, unimpeded. So we are able to kind of save the um, exterior shell of the building by this approach. You can go to the next slide. Uh, next slide when you're ready. Thanks. So um, another challenge was fire truck access. Um, you know, meeting with the fire marshals um, during the approval process, the fires of the buildings of the north were, um, were in recent memories. I said they they burned down just 15 years ago, so there was there was obviously a concern with um, with fire safety here, um, given the site. And what made this further complicated is the single point of access, as I mentioned before, and the fact that. Um, there was a canal drive to the west of the building along the canal drive, um, which is on the upper part of this page. It's in such close proximity to the building, it's actually in the collapse zone. So it wasn't a safe place for a fire truck to park and, and fight the fire um, if the building were able to catch on fire. So the only safe space available was on the lower side of the building towards the river. And that's um, unfortunately where the die house stood, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, so that was really the only option to provide um, a safe means of, of fighting a fire for this complex. So this first slide shows in the cross-hatched area where the die house stood. If we go to the next slide, um, you can see the current configuration where that's, that's now a parking lot where uh, the fire truck can pull in safely to uh, be out of the collapse zone of the building. And we can go to the next slide. So, you know, the next, I guess, second order effect of this um, big challenge here was the actual demolition of the die house. And uh, 
you know, as, as a preservation architect, this is really, really tough for us. Um, you know, we, we try to preserve the best we can, but in all cases, it's, it's not possible. So we were put in the awkward position of needing to advocate for the, the demolition of a structure in order to um, save the, uh, the rest of the mill complex. Um, so we, we worked very close um, with the SHPO on this. Um, as you can see through the photos here, the die house itself was in far worse shape than the main mill. Um, it experienced its own fire some years ago. You can see kind of the charring in these photos and there were the trees that Thatcher mentioned growing out of the roof. It, it was really falling apart and um, honestly beyond uh, saving anyways, regardless of fire truck access in our opinion. Um, so again, you know, we we're sad to see this building go, but um, it was for the greater good of, of the complex. And you can go on to the next slide. And there's a few more pictures of the die house here um, as well. But um, another challenge of this project was code compliance. Um, you get because the uh, of the the fire truck access issues and the potential difficulties of safely fighting a fire. We worked with the Windsor Locks Fire Marshal and um, what they requested us to do here was actually classify the building as a high rise. Even though the building didn't automatically trigger that threshold, we were still required to do that. So we had to implement additional life, safe, life safety on this project, uh, like a fire command center, a more robust fire alarm system, things of that nature. In addition to the things you would have normally done anyways, like adding sprinklers, um, you know, fire separations, all that kind of stuff. And what, what made the code compliance even further tough here is that um, because of the building's construction type, its area and its height, um, it was not allowed under the International Building Code, which is what most uh, rehab projects and all new construction projects adhere to. It was not possible to have that program within this building. So the only option for us to make this work was utilizing a different building code, the international existing building code. And there's a path to code compliance through this code, um, which is more or less taking a holistic look at the entire project and doing a series of calculations to arrive at a, a final score, um, which you either pass or don't pass. So we were able to, to pass with this approach. Um, but suffice to say, I'm sure, um, most of you looking at this probably interpreted as Greek. It's it's very tough and complicated to do this. Um, I don't think many um, architects or code officials know about this, but again, I, I mentioned this because it was really the only way um, to get the program into this particular building. And you can go on to the next slide. You, uh, uh... That code, uh, uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Because I've never heard of that. Yeah. Sure. So um, in the International Existing Building Code, um, there's a certain chapter in that code. I believe it's, it used to be Chapter 12. Now it's 14. It's called Code Compliance Alternatives. So um, it basically allows, like I said, a holistic approach to code compliance. So there are different categories that are individually evaluated and given a score based on the level of uh, safety or fire protection you have for that particular element, such as height, area, sprinklers. And you go through and do those series of calculations and you add up um, a total score. And that total score is then compared against a, uh, a threshold requirement for that particular use of the, of the project. So you either pass or you don't pass. All right, thanks. Yeah, that's that's very helpful because I'm I'm sure I'll find a use for it somewhere. Yep, comes in handy. Yeah, absolutely. You you might be looking at it behind me. <laughs> thanks. Yep, you're welcome. Um, but the last challenge I'll mention and um, is the the National Register nomination, not necessarily tied to the site. Um, but this also posed a challenge. You know, when we, we first came into the project in 2016, uh, we learned that it was on the state register, but not on the federal register, the national register rather, but that it was eligible. Um, however, since that initial listing, the buildings to the north, which I had I mentioned burned down, 
So there was the loss of that, um, that those buildings to the complex. And there was some concern over, is there enough integrity of the main mill to hold together this nomination? Um, you know, couple that with the fact that we are actually proposing some demolition of those remaining structures in our plan. It was, um, it was a pretty um, delicate um, nomination to say the least, but um, a huge thanks to um, Nina Caruso on our team, to Lucas, and of course the SHPO for, for working through us with this, but we are eventually successful on getting it on the list. And you can go to the next slide, which I will turn back over to uh, Thatcher temporarily. I'm going to take this one, Mike. Emily. Um, thank you. So Thatcher and Mike touched on the site a little bit, so I won't repeat too much of what they said. But I think one of the things that was most challenging, and but ultimately the most sort of interesting and rewarding part of this project is the site itself. Um, so I'll give you just a very quick overview. So obviously here's, um, you see the building on the left side, you have the canal trail that runs um, to the west and then to the east you have the river. Um, and access to the site is represented by this blue arrow here. So you turn off Bridge Street and then cars make their way through. You can either park under the building or in um, a lot of this surface parking. Um, and the major issue, like Mike said, is that this building is located in a floodplain. So um, when there is a flood, half of the site, particularly this lower level here and the covered parking underneath the building are underwater. Um, so you obviously need a place to both put the cars that would ordinarily park there and make sure that there's still a way for people to get in and out of the site and for um, emergency services to access it. So we needed to make sure that we had enough parking um, on the site in the event of a flood so that we could both meet our zoning requirements and make sure that residents had a place to put their cars when things are underwater. Um, so we created this gravel sort of overflow parking area um, on the north end of the site. Ordinarily, it's, wrote, it's gated off. Um, our maintenance team and, and others have access to the gate um, and we open it and we'll have people put cars there. We haven't had to do it yet um, because of a flood, but it's there if we need it. Um, and then in terms of access, um, ultimately this canal path, we turned it into a pedestrian walkway that's closed to cars ordinarily. Um, but if there is an emergency, we have these removable bollards at the front and the back that our maintenance team has access to and can just get rid of them so that cars and other emergency vehicles can make their way in and out of the site um, along there. And then the second major complication of this site is less exciting, but um, there was just a lot of different agencies and entities involved. So the land, most of the land here is owned by our neighbor Alstrom, who has um, a factory on the other side of Bridge Street. And then obviously Beacon became involved. The state is involved because of the state park trail here. And then the town became involved because they created this really nice picnic area up on the northern part of the site as well. So it just gets very complicated with um, leases and subleases and who's liable for things and who has access to stuff. And the state and the town were both really cooperative in making that happen, as was Alstrom. They were great. Um, but it's just a lot of conversations with lawyers. Um, but ultimately, it worked out and we're able to have the residents of Montgomery enjoy these amenities, but also people from the public um, can come use the picnic area, use the trail. So it's a really nice mix of residents and the public enjoying it. And um, it worked out. It worked out very well, despite the challenges there. Can I, can I add a little more about the site? Yeah. Uh, Bill Karoski here. Um, so this is, as we've said before, is a really complicated site. It's essentially an island. Um, and the, where the blue line is, um, that is the low, low point of the site. And again, as Mike pointed out, there were two buildings that 
were there that we took out, but the site is uh, in the floodway of the Connecticut River. And what that meant was that we could not alter the capacity of the site to hold flood waters in the event of a flood. So um, that combined with the fact that our, we had to provide dry access from the housing units to safety in the event of a flood, which means that the exit out of the building and to dry to high ground had to be above the 500 year floodplain. But thirdly, we had uh, on site soil contamination. And so the, and, and it was, uh, um, we had to save, we had to keep the contamination on site. We could move it around, but we had to keep it on site. So we had, we had to regrade the entrance for fire truck access. We took out two buildings. Uh, we had to move soil around, but we had to do it in a way uh, where we kept the volume of the site and its ability to hold, uh, <coughs> others, um, you know, it had to equal out at the end of the day. And it became fairly complicated because we, um, you know, the buildings that were taken down um, were either considered solids or, volu or volume in that calculation of uh, flood water. And so it was site aspects of this were very complicated. And I think Bus and O'Neill did a great job of um, dealing with those three different things and, and uh, get, coming up with a solution. Great, thanks, Al. Yep. Yes, thanks, Bill and Emily. Um, so now that we, we've kind of discussed some challenges, um, I want to point out a few unique features of, of the, the finished uh, mill. One was these uh, historic features and displays that we ended up um, adding to the building. Because of the loss of the, the die house, we wanted to be able to capture that history somehow in any way we could. So we ended up um, conceiving these uh, kind of exhibit areas on each floor. And um, that kind of spiraled into, you know, why limit that to just the die house? Let's celebrate the whole history of, of the mill complex. So. Um, on each floor by the elevators in the lobby, we have these uh, various displays kind of showcasing the history of the building um, throughout the years. And um, if you look at the picture on the right, you'll actually see a piece of the die house itself we were actually able to save. Um, along with historic photos, we found some of the old blueprints for a few of the buildings. So. Um, you know, I, I think this turned out really well and it may become perhaps a new norm for us on other projects, uh, given how well it turned out. And um, a kudos to Mercedes Fernando at Beacon for, for pulling this together. I think the finished product is, is really good. We can move on to the next slide. Another interesting um, aspect of this mill was the historic signage. Originally, there was um, this large lettering you see that spanned across the west facade of all three buildings. Um, when we first came to the site in 2016, there was some partial letter lettering left on building three only. Um, we had hoped to save it, but after a closer examination, it was um, not really salvageable. Um, but we were able to get an, an authentic replication as possible, uh, if you want to advance to the next slide. We worked with a sign company, uh, Expose. They did a terrific job. They actually templated and hand measured all of the existing letters to really hone in on exactly what that font type was and reproduce all of the new letters. And we are also able to track down the company who um, designed and fabricated the original mesh sign panels for the mill in 1920. Uh, Buffalo Wireworks, I believe, was the company name. And we work closely with them to um, replicate in a, as an authentic um, mesh panel as possible. So as I mentioned, you know, the sign is not the original anymore, but it's um, just about as authentic as, as one can get. Can go on to the next slide. Uh, the next thing I'll mention here are the windows. Um, there were many, many, many windows as you would expect in a, in a mill of this size, um, many hundreds. 
And given that there were three different building types, each with, the, each with its own window types, I think there were over 30 different window styles on this project. So you can kind of see the various shapes and sizes and configurations on this drawing here, um, just to kind of give you a flavor of what was involved. And each, each of these had their own corresponding details, um, some of which matched each other because they were similar, but um, it, was, it was quite the process of getting this all documented. To move on to the next slide. So with regard to the windows, um, this, this I think was probably the toughest window to, to get matched up correctly. Um, this is the, the typical window on building three, um, you know, fairly typical of a, of a mill in this um, vintage with the internal operable vent in the middle of a, a fixed portion here. Um, given that all of the new windows needed to be energy efficient, that meant um, thicker glass, heavier frames. So um, it was difficult to engineer a window that um, replicated these sight lines, um, but we were luckily able to do it, um, as you can see on the photo on the right. You can go one more slide. Um, this is another uh, set of windows. In some cases, for some of the uh, window styles, we did side by side mock ups. Um, so this is a, uh, one of the double hung windows in building three, uh, one on the left showing the original and the right showing the replacement. So in most cases, we were able to get more or less dead on to the profiles and dimensions of the existing windows uh, with the replacements. Uh, who made the windows? There were actually two, two different companies. That's a good question, Todd. Um, because there were um, two different main um, styles of windows. Buildings one and two originally had uh, wood windows. So those um, replacements were aluminum clad wood. They were um, fabricated by um, architectural window. And the windows on building three um, were extruded aluminum and they were done by universal windows. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yep. So we thought a nice way to, to wrap this up. Um, kind of informally is just to kind of go through a series of pictures of, of the building um, taken before the construction happened, during, and after. Um, I, I just love this, this first photo here. It reminds me of um, seeing old photos of the, the towns around Chernobyl that have been abandoned for years and seeing how nature has started to reclaim, um, reclaim the space. So I think this is the the fifth floor of building three, um, you can just see how nature has really just started to, to reclaim this, um, all sorts of moss growing, um, no trees out of this building, but um, it was just really, really interesting to see this as we walk through. Uh, if we advance to the next slide, you can see some progress photos here um, on the left. I think that's Bill Krosky in the foreground there. Um, you can see how, you know, it's, it's all been cleaned up in this photo. The concrete has been um, been restored. Um, in the, the final photo on the right, you can see the finished product in building three. Um, so we were able to showcase these beautiful um, mushroom columns inside the units. And um, we actually decided to leave some of the, um, I won't, won't call it damage, I'll call it uh, character defining features of the ceiling here. Um, just to, to let people know that they're in a building that's nearly 100 years old and it's, um, it has a story to tell. Let me go to the next photo. Uh, this is building two. The photo on the left shows it as it was before construction. Um, this is actually a fairly intact portion of building two, but there were other areas where the floors were a lot more buckled and rotted, in some cases just missing. Um, but you can kind of give you a flavor in terms of, um, of the, the, uh, the layout of the building. And the photo on the right is, is showing um, once that's all been cleaned up, um, all the lead paint's been removed and we're starting to uh, lay out the partitions of the hallways and the units. You can go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. There's a little bit of a lag on this. Oh, no, sorry. sorry. Yeah, okay. sorry about it. It'll, it'll happen. No worries. On here we have some finished photos of building two. 
um, you know, and we were able to, again, you know, showcase the, the timber ceilings, the beams, and the columns um, in the new units. And I, I must say that the quality of natural light in, in these apartments is, is really good, given the, uh, the large window area on the walls. We go to the next photo. So I'll go back to, to talk about building three for just a moment here. Um, when we, we first arrived back in 2016, the, the exterior of building three it looked in fairly good shape. Um, but, but as we got into construction and we, um, we started to take a closer look at it and started to remove um, the old coatings on that building, um, we realized that the, the concrete itself behind those coatings was in uh, worse shape than we had imagined. So um, the contractors actually sounded out with a little hammer the entire facade to understand where the concrete was starting to fail. So you can see in this photo, there's some large areas of concrete that are, are missing. And that's uh, as a result of this process. Um, but we were able to um, repair the concrete, put up a new coating that allows uh, water to safely transfuse uh, through the structure so as to avoid damage like this in the future. And here's an aerial photograph of the mill. I think this was taken at the beginning of construction, um, or maybe towards the end. I do see the new windows in part of the building. Um, but th this will kind of give you a sense of, of the setting it's really in. As, as Thatcher mentioned, the views are, are just spectacular, especially on the riverside on the upper floors. Um, if, if you haven't seen them yet, um, if you can, I recommend checking it out. It's, it's truly, truly one in a million. Go to the next slide. This is a, a photo farther away. You can kind of see how this um, kind of ties in with the um, the bridge, as, as Thatcher mentioned. Kind of the first thing people experience coming into town to Main Street is this mill, and just really how iconic it is uh, to the town of Windsor Locks. How much of an anchor it is. Go to the next slide. This is another. Um, bird's eye view looking the opposite direction. So you can, you can kind of see how this canal walk on the, the west side of the building fronting the, uh, the building kind of acts as a, a people mover, so to speak, to allow um, both the residents of the building and the public um, to access the park to the north. And this is a view from the opposite side of Main Street. Um, you can see the the new sign on building three there, um, and it's, it's full glory now. Can go to the next slide. Here's another uh, pedestrian view of the canal walk. Um, one thing I will mention here that I, I forgot to mention before, you see in the foreground, there's a smaller building um, in front of the, the, large, the taller mill. This was um, one of the few uh, smaller buildings that survived the fire from, I think it was 2006 that we were able to, to keep. Um, but this building was entirely within the floodplain. Um, so it's being used as um, kind of a, a maintenance and groundskeeping uh, area for the maintenance staff. But we we're able to restore it and keep it. And here's a photo from the, uh, the parking lot side where the die house once stood. So um, you can see here how. Um, there's an ample room for a fire truck to get in safely away from the building. And uh, another few views of the interiors. Um, again, the, the natural light here is, is really spectacular. E even this photo being building one has the, uh, the smallest windows of the three buildings that we talked about. And uh, even in this building, it's um, nice quality of light. Uh, this is also on the canal walk, um, approaching the main entry to the building, which is off of the canal walk. Um, building one had these series of uh, old loading doors on each floor that we were able to uh, restore and in some cases um, replace uh, to match. So we were able to, uh, to keep that. And this is the mail room, um, just as you come in right before you hit the lobby.
And this is uh, one end of the lobby. So, um, you know, certainly the, the desired aesthetic here was keeping in, in tune with the industrial nature of the, the building. So exposed mechanicals, piping, um, the lighting style was, was very carefully chosen to reflect that as well, as well as some of the, uh, the artwork and furniture. Um, same thing goes for the community room. This is on the upper floor. And these are a couple more photos um, of the community room on the right and uh, the lobby on the left. So thank you for, for taking the time to look at the note with us today. Um, before I turn things back over, um, I just want to give a quick shout out to a few people. I mean, of a project of this size, there are obviously many, many, many contributors, um, literally hundreds. Uh, I won't be able to mention everyone today, but I just do want to recognize a few people on our team. Uh, the first is Nina Caruso. I, I think she's on here today. Um, you know, the historic tax credit application, um, you know, she really played a vital role in that. Um, the other, Erin Marcino, I don't think she could be here today, but, um, you know, she was our eyes and ears on the ground when this thing was um, under construction. There's probably a whole separate one hour seminar we could do on the um, things that come up during um, construction, during a mill restoration. And um, the other is Bill Krosky. I mean, he, uh, he really took this conceptual program and, and brought it into the, uh, the finished and polished design you see before you today. And lastly, but certainly not least, is Beacon. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this is a, a super tough project. There were so many hurdles, but they never wavered or balked at any of these things. Uh, they took them in stride. So, you know, congratulations to Beacon. It was really a, a pleasure to work with Thatcher, Emily, Dar, Mercedes, and the whole gang. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for everything, you guys. This was a great presentation. Emily, did you have anything else to add? I'm sorry. No, not at all. I was just going to express our thanks to Mike and Bill and the rest of the Krosky team. They were awesome and appreciate you inviting us here today and giving us a chance to tell you a little bit more about Montgomery. It's very nice. It was a great I'll presentation. I'll, I'll second the thanks to, to Krosky and team. I mean, there's things in this presentation, you know, we, we try to follow along pretty closely with the design aspects, but there's things in this presentation that we didn't even know about. So it gives you a sense of, of the depth of the work involved. And uh, um, it's, it's also worth, worth um, noting, you know, the trust, um, the Preservation Trust's role in this project, and our thanks to them. Brad Scheid um, was really critical, a critical guide in some of the tax credit aspects here, and just general, general knowledge of, of, you know, how these things get done. Um, so I wanted to thank, thank him, and I, I think uh, maybe the Fuss O'Neill folks are on the phone, but they were you know, as, as you heard in Mike's presentation, the, the grading aspects, the flood floodplain, brownfields aspects were were really critical. There were, you know, there were moments when we thought it, they weren't even solvable, and maybe the project wouldn't work. And and Fuss and O'Neill and Joe Lenahan um, uh, really found the solutions. I think Joe um, was on. I saw his name. Is he? Yeah, I thought I, maybe I saw his name. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, you guys did a great job. It was a pleasure working with you all. Um, I, now that I'm starting to thank people, I have to talk about, and I don't think Chris Kervick's on, but the town of Windsor Locks was amazing. I mean, this is partly a thanks, but it's partly sort of for those thinking about projects. I could not imagine doing this without a supportive town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just from, you know, all the tip, like zoning to sewer access to, um, you know, we did this TIF financing, uh, you know, to advocating at the state level, just really, really critical um, and just not possible without the town and specifically Chris Kerbeck. Well, thanks again, you guys. Um, we want to open it up now. We have about 10 minutes left um, to questions. We have a bunch of people on here. And I know we have some questions that came in beforehand. So Jordan has those. Um, Jordan, did you want to? 
read some of them off? Sure. So you guys really answered a lot of the questions that came in beforehand, but um, one that we had that I don't know if you really said um, specifically was, um, what was the most challenging component of the capital stack? Um, Thatcher, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, each one had its own challenges. I mean, getting an allocation of tax credits is not easy in itself. So I, I guess we probably, like the low income housing tax credits. For Emily and I, that requires the most amount of work. And then getting an equity investor to invest in both historic tax credits and low income tax credits together in a mixed income building is really hard. That's a, a lot of, you know, uh, tax credit investors, there's a, it's a robust marketplace. You can go out and find them. Um, but once you start to have these quirky things like a lot of market rate units and historic aspects and flood aspects and brownfield, the, the, the sort of market thins out. So we had to spend a lot of time looking for the right investor. But then, and then the state funding, you know, was not easy either, which is why the, the city was involved. And we didn't even talk about like how complicated just the like title was on this property, um, which is a whole nother story. But the land, the land was owned, was owned by the mills. All the mills up and down the river here were, they didn't own the land. The land was owned by the company that created the canal. And the mills had 999 year leases to that land. So when we bought the buildings, we were buying the buyer, the seller was assigning us those old leases, which were illegible. They were in cursive and photocopied a few times and in the, you know, in the records in the town and you couldn't decipher all of them. And they referenced things, you know, that were, you know, like horse, you know, you can go where the horse like usually goes. Um, and, you know, we didn't know where the horses usually went. Um, so what did that mean? So we had to like re, and then even just providing evidence. So, so we, un everyone understood that the canal was now owned by Alstrom, the factory nearby. And everyone understood that they were the, they were the land owner and that the lease was with them, but there was no real legal evidence of that. So we had to like dig through old records to really prove that they even owned the land and then we had to redo the leases. So that's not an answer to the question, but I had to talk about that. <laughs> um, I, maybe to end on, uh, it, it, this is more of a bigger picture question, but I, I really thought it was good. Um, someone asked, what is preventing more adaptive reuse of mill buildings? Just thought maybe you'd have some ideas about what's preventing more of this. I know the answer to that. It's lack of developers. Hmm. 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 You know, there was there have been some good advances in um, the the state environmental regulation around this that made this project possible. One thing we didn't mention is that we used this program called. BRRP, Brownfield Revitalization and Redevelopment Program or some, something like that, um, which um, without it, the liability of buying and remediating the site would be a real deterrent. So that's been helpful. Um, there are probably some cleanups to that that would make it easier to use. Um, and I mean, you have to you have to acknowledge there was a lot of state money in this project. So you know, we need you need to do things as complicated. You need state money. I mean, re, you know, kind of you're sort of rebuilding these buildings in a lot of ways. Um, there's all kinds of like a lot of those beams had to be replaced. A lot of the floorboards had to be replaced. Um, it's not it's not cheap. 
So the state money is really critical. And um, the more funds there are for brownfields and for historic redevelopment, the more possible these projects are. Thank you again for those uh, answers. Um, we're gonna wrap it up now unless anyone else has some questions um, online. Oh, we got one through the chat. Uh, Susan asked, oh, Susan asked, uh, she said she lives in an old mill building that was converted to condos and the developer went bankrupt. They still have 1.2 million in remediation to do. What, where can we get more funding to assist? So that seems like a question that's very complicated and we'd probably have to answer offline mm -hmm. unless anyone, uh, Thatcher, or Emily, or Bill, or Mike, you have any answers? I mean, yeah, check out, there's a, there's a website um, on the Brownfields funding program. I would take a look there and start calling, you know, the, the folks at DECD that are referenced on that website to talk through the issues. Um, but there are a couple people there that, that have some brownfields funding that, that maybe would be helpful. I think, you know, the state budget crisis, which is sort of ex has extended and is exacerbated by COVID, I'm sure, um, has made the resources slim, but you, sh you should, you should take a look, take a look there. That's good advice, thank you. And then another one came in um, from Aaron Good. Um, Aaron asked if the recent changes in the Connecticut Transfer Act um, regarding brownfields and polluted properties would have made this project easier. Hmm. Joe, Joe's on, he might be able to answer that better than I can, but I know that we will kind of, the transfer act wasn't applicable to us because we entered the BRRP program. So mm -hmm. I don't know if those are the recent changes you're referencing. I don't follow the law that closely, but that was important. Using the BRRP basically take, as I understand it as the sort of non-expert, takes you out of the transfer act and into sort of a different regime, which is requires cleanup, but it's a little, um, a little more straightforward. Gotcha. And then finally we got um, a question. What was the total development cost and um, are all the units leased and who is the property management company? So total development costs were about $60 million. And so that's for 160 units. And uh, Beacon, as an affiliate called Beacon Residential Management, which manages the building. We manage, we like managing everything we develop because then we can sort of see through the project and deliver on, deliver on all our commitments. And we're about 96% leased right now. We have five or six left to lease. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that. That's yeah. great. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you very much for today. Um, I hope we can invite you back for your next uh, successful project. We'd love to see it. Um, so thanks for all the time that you guys put in today. It was a great presentation. And um, we just have some sort of uh, last uh, wrap up stuff that we do at the end of all of these. Um, of course, these programs are made possible through uh, your support. So please consider if you're not a, a member to become a member today. And we've posted some um, resources, but we will we will post this, Jordan. Right? We're going to post this on our on our uh, YouTube page for everyone. And um, if people this want copies, will be on our YouTube. Page. Yep. So it's going to be recorded on our YouTube page and. Uh, if people want copies of the presentation, we could also send it out. You know, that's not an issue. Just contact me or, or Jordan. Um, and next week, we are going to welcome James Quinn, who's the Tribal Preservation Officer for the Mohegan Tribe. So um, thanks again, you guys, a lot. It was, it was a great presentation.
and uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much.